Hi, Nick here from Pods with Nick and James. Just a quick one before we get into this podcast. I'm going to say a massive thank you for the uh, support that we've received since starting these podcasts. We thoroughly enjoy it and we look forward to creating more. If you want to have your say on any topics that we've discussed or suggest future topics, then you can do so at www.reddit.com slash r slash Nick and James Pods. And if you want to support us, you can do so for uh, from as little as £1 a month. And you can do that at www.patreon.com slash James. Anyway, back to the podcast. Hi guys and welcome back to Pods with Nick and James. I'm Nick. And this is James. Hello there. And this week we hope to find the reason why soldiers hate the month of March. How you doing, James? I'm um, I'm okay. I'm 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 doing all right. So this month we this week rather we have decided on the topic of military and I, I, or rather I decided on the topic of military. Um, so let's get straight into it. Obviously, military exists as a means to defend and a means to attack. Um, and military's main use is um, during war. But can you tell me? The eight reasons why war starts. Okay. Um, disagreement over land. So like as in invasion. Um, disagreement over a specific resource. Um I can't remember the exact one, but the one used in the in the Crusade, uh, God wills it. Uh, so it's See, like religion. Dios. Yeah, so religion. So uh, you could. Do, would you say that a, a civil does? Are we counting civil wars? Civil unrest. Yeah, that's a, that's a reason. Okay. All right. In which case, then any leadership change. So civil um, unrest is different to revolution, but both are um, both are reasons. Okay, well, military coup, then, um, I guess. Uh, would that that would be revolution, I suppose, that would come under. Okay. Um, uh, I guess, so, okay, we covered disagreement over land, disagreement over resource, religion. Um, you've got five so far, which is pretty good. I mean, I'm thinking... I hate to say it, but, like, just race genocide, like you had in in uh, Serbia and you had in all of the... So nationalism, kind of... pride, yeah, sense yeah. of superiority, or superiority, I suppose. Yep. Yeah. Um... All right, and I'm just thinking, I mean, do people ever go to war, literally, is it ever just stated? Yeah, we're doing it for the money. <laughs> well, that's that's economic people's... gain, isn't it? So, but yeah. yes, yes, absolutely, they do. They, it's okay, a resource, right, isn't fine. it? I, so... I wasn't, I wasn't sure if they were ever, um, yeah. ever that blasé about it. Like, yeah. you know, like if, if America had have said rather than, ah, oh, we're invading uh, Iraq and Afghanistan, not for looking for weapons of mass destruction, they're charging us too much for our oil. We want to get it direct from the source. Yeah, well, they wouldn't tell us that in the media, would they? But that's definitely that's definitely why. <laughs> mm. um, so there are two okay. more, and I would be surprised if you got these two. You've done really well. Well, um, I, t- I, t- I tell you what, like I, I want you to. I, I'm going to give up there, but could you go through the list because I feel sure. I've divvied and and gone about the point and maybe come up with several answers which are in fact the same answers. Yeah, so yeah, let's yeah. Hear the so we've list. got we've got economic gain. Yeah, mm-hmm. so that's resources, money, wealth power um well maybe not power so much um territorial gain yeah uh religion mm-hmm. nationalism so that that encompasses 
a lot of racism and 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 other other forms of uh, difference, shall we say, that aren't necessarily accepted. And we've got Revenge, which you didn't mention, but is very, very good reason, especially in the Dark Ages, as to why people went to war. Well, it, mm, it's weird because some of the Crusades, you could literally argue, not the whole things, not the whole things, but one of the reasons why the Crusades happened. Yes, it was religion. Yes, it was the it was the Pope looking at a map, realizing he was surrounded. But part of that was um, revenge to against some of the Saracen raiding that yep. was happening yep. uh, at the time. But okay, you know what? It's interesting that uh, that's literally used as a reason. Yeah. Like, ah, yeah. oh, remember when? Remember when they invaded a couple of years ago? Well, we're gonna get them back. Hey, let me let me be completely clear here. I'm pretty sure I started a few wars in school when somebody stole my biscuits. So yeah, but were they good biscuits? They were. That's why I went to war. Yeah. Yeah. No, that's uh, that, that's what I figured. That's what I figured. Rich tea or hobnob? Oh, bourbons. Or digestives. Mate. Bourbons. Bourbons on the way. Okay. Bourbons. Absolutely. All right. Sorry. I'm back. Um... Away from bourbons. Back to war. <laughs> um... So civil unrest. Which you yep. mentioned, of course. Uh, revolution, which are two different things, apparently. Um, not that I'm smart enough to know the difference. Um, yeah, so they, did they split the hairs in the in the definitions there? Or? In, that, I'm at a in loss. that respect. So um, I suppose revolution okay. isn't necessarily... doesn't always start from the inside, does it? That's true. Um, yeah. And then defence or preemptive wars. You see, that's the one that always gets me. I don't think... I don't think preemptive military action... I Or I don't believe it... I don't think it's justified. Because no. the world is full of so much uncertainty. Going, ah, well, we're going to attack first just to make sure doesn't just doesn't have enough weight with myself no and i completely understand that i've always been um quite reserved when it comes to expressing um, my opinion and i think you can't always take first glance as gospel what you observe on first glance can often be tainted by your own thoughts and feelings at the time and i think that's where people need to take a, a second to think process before they react. Hmm. Okay, was that all eight? That was all eight, yep. Yeah. So, um, hmm. economic, territorial, religion, nationalism, revenge, civil unrest, revolution, and defence. Interesting. Hmm. Hmm. And what did... Uh... See what, in the First and Second World Wars, what were those claimed as? They were claimed... Well, to be fair, they were started over nationalism, weren't they? Mm. Um, I suppose a little bit of it would be economic gain, but I think from our perspective, not necessarily the uh, the German perspective, but um, from our perspective, it was definitely more um, economic and territorial gain than it was um, nationalism. But from their side... No, from yeah, from our side it was more nationalism, but from their side they could say it was economic or territorial gain. I definitely confused the hell out of that answer, didn't I? So, mm. do you know who's got the largest army in the world right now? Okay, so... I have some facts to do with this, mm -hmm. which are just kind of things that I've picked up, so I'd, it'll be interesting to see which ones are right, which ones are not. Uh, right now, yep. the largest army in the world. Yep. I'm going to take a guess, and it's probably going to be terribly wrong, but I'm going to go for it anyway. I'm going to guess that Russia has the largest army. 
the largest standing army in the world? Um, no, it doesn't. And as a matter of fact, it doesn't um, even come in the top three. Ooh, okay. Does it come in the top five? I'm not 100% on that, but I don't think so. Okay, interesting. Okay, so my next guess would be the obvious one. America, or the United States of America. Top Two. three, but not top one. Goddamn. Okay, it's not North Korea, is it? No, I think you're thinking too small. Think population, or populous. God damn, so obvious now that you've said it. China. Absolutely. The Red Army. When you right? have when you have an abundance of people, you might as well stick a fair few of them in your army, right? They have over two million conscripted armed force personnel. Um, with India and the US having one point four million each. That kind of makes sense. Um to be fair, like that, that makes that's actually really. If, if anything, that's actually uh, not nice, but it just it's ordered, you know. Yeah. Like China has a huge number of people. Um, it shouldn't surprise me that its military uh, matches that. Um, Interestingly, most of uh, a lot of the population of China uh, is in the south and east of the country, with like the north and west kind of being incredibly mountainous. Um, so yeah. it's kind of interesting. It's not a this is where most of the people live in this big country equally spread out. It's no, this is where most of the people live on the border of or on the along this line well that's the same uh, as russia isn't it i mean you've got most of siberia which is barren and freezing cold and mm. it's got about 30 people with per mile um whereas like the western coast or i say western coast the western border of of russia is mainly where most of the population is isn't it? Mm. where it's pop where it's actually inhabitable should we say no, that's that's a fair that's a fair point. That's a fair point. Mm. Um, so, if hmm. China has the largest army, with uh, India and the US coming in a very close second, do you know what the smallest army in the world is? Is it the Vatican City? I'm really surprised you knew that, but yes, the do you know what they're called? Yeah. Okay. So, all right. So, first off, that was a stab in the dark. Okay, but it was a calculated stab in the dark because what's the smallest country in the world? Are we? <laughs> yeah, Vatican City. <laughs> it's it's Vatican City. So I just literally went by by that. Additionally, their army is isn't it made up mostly of ex Swiss special forces, and yep. they're wearing like although they're wearing medieval attire and carrying a halberd, each one of those. Sorry to say it, gentlemen. Ridiculously dressed men at arms is an absolute beefcake and killing machine. Yep, they are the, the pontifical um, Swiss Guard, Untab and they are the oldest army in the world as well. They are, they remain, and I, I say this loosely. So there are older armies, mm. however, their format has changed since they were implemented, whereas the um, pontifical Swiss Guard were implemented in 1506 and remain unchanged. There is 110 single, and I say single as in not married, Swiss Catholic men who must be over foot, 5 foot 8 inches tall. So I use the term smallest army very loosely. That's interesting. Huh. Okay. Yeah. There you, there you have it, folks. Largest army fits with the largest country. Smallest army fits with the smallest country. Mm. Um, and whilst we're on any... the topic of linking linking things up, can you tell me where did the first army appear in records? Now, this is the... 
Oh, it wasn't good old King Sargon, was it? <laughs> it was Sargon of Akkad. Yes, <laughs> fucking... I mean... <laughs> yep, cut that out. Um, yes, knew it. Uh, yep. I did kind of give a good segue there. If you didn't get that, I'd have been upset, but yeah. Yeah, no, sorry. And the uh, first military action was in a war between Sumer and Elam in mm. 2600 BC. Now, Sumer and Elam are basically modern-day Iraq and Iran. They weren't fighting over the Tigris and Euphrates, were they? More than likely, yeah. That's pretty much what their world was built on back then, wasn't it? <sighs> Annoyingly a lot. All right, if you're from uh, Iran, Assyria, and Turkey, I do not mean to undermine you at all, but just, like, the sheer amount of uh, poverty that is caused by countries upstream damming the river is bad. The amount of tension there is over the lack of a resource which, in England, where it always rains, we take for granted, uh, is genuinely... It's, it's completely alien to us, so apologies. Uh, if I seem flippant, but it is genuinely also terrifying that you've got peace treaties and threats of military action over hydroelectric dams being bought, being built. Um, yeah. To be fair, like I think the main quibble they've got is with where the power that they're generating is going. Mm. Because I mean, take take Dungeness Power Station for example. Yeah. Where does the power that's generated at Dungeness go? Well, I kind of was assuming um, that it would go up to London. No, it goes to France. But they... But they own... They own our power. Do they own our power stations too? Hmm. Well, that they yeah. I know that no, I know the nuclear power from that power station goes to France, and I know this because I know people that work there. We really need to. Um... I don't know why. Why am I? Wait a minute. That means if they threat, if there's a threat of invasion, we can turn their lights off. Yeah. 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 And this is why, this is why French military victories were few. But this is the thing I've I've heard. Okay, so you've probably got a load of facts there, and I'm probably wrong here. But I'd heard that historically, the French are in fact the most successful military country in the world. Yeah, yeah. So up until about the 1800s they were the absolute powerhouse of military mm. um, up until about the 1860s or so they were the people the country that spent the most on their military they were the the, the country that had um like post roman empire as it were they were the uh... they did copy the roman model and i find it interesting like uh, do you mind if i go on a little tangent here absolutely carry on Okay, so the Roman model is you take half of your taxes and put it into your military. It's weirdly enough, it's also what the Soviet Union was doing back in the day when that was during the Cold War. Mm. It's what some countries, uh, whether more fascist or militaristic, still do it. You can't ever go above that 50% because it means the rest of your infrastructure uh, ends up getting stretched to the point where it ends up breaking down. But it's interesting just how many countries go that far. Like, doesn't... Um, I may be misquoting here, and I'm hoping this will segue quite nicely into your next fact. When it comes to the uh, taxes going into military, I know the America... Uh, sorry, our cousins across the pond... Uh, they've got like, isn't it 20, 25, 20% of their taxpayer money goes solely into their military? I only know based on gross domestic product, and it's about 4% of their gross I... domestic product. In which um... case then, I am completely wrong, and uh, yeah, 
but I do know that the Roman Empire at least did put half of its money back into its military. Well, but I could all... do I could do budgets. We can we can actually segue into that. So let's go. Um, basically, in like the UK back in 1983, spent 26.4 billion uh, billion dollars because that's the the stats that I was going by because I was actually nosing about the Americans and I compared it to the UK. Mm. So back in 1983, the UK spent 26.4 billion uh, billion dollars on defence, um, and in which uh, by 2021, can you guess how much? It had risen by in nearly 40, uh, 40 years. Okay, so um, first off, oh shit, it's going up. <laughs> um, I shouldn't be surprised. I am. Um, I don't know, for some reason I'm perhaps a bit naive here, but uh, I thought military generally had shrunk in this country as we are no longer the world power that we once were in fact just i will actually answer your question but first whereabouts is england when it comes to standing army are we even in the top 20 we are yeah yeah as it goes 17 for... no we're about fifth get out of town yeah for yearly spend on military but i will say this the there is a clear leader by a marked margin. Oh, I was thinking numbers wise for Yeah, no, I mean I mean, forces. I mean, um this is budget. This is purely okay. budget. Right, and, right, right, right. Um, we may well be in the top five mm. but we are dwarfed by the leader of their budget. Okay, well alright. So okay. yeah, how uh, much how has it grown? How by much has it grown in by forty years? I hate where my mind's going because it's gone, oh, my positive view on this is wrong. It clearly must be horribly, horribly dark. Has it doubled? It's more than doubled. Um, so it's okay. currently at £68 billion pounds per year that we spend on military and defence. Yeah, that's a good number of Harrier jets. So, comparatively... In 1983, how much do you think the U.S. spent on their military? Can you give me the figure for England again? My mind has gone in to poop. In 1983, we spent 26.4 billion, and in 2020, well, 2021, um, we spent 68 billion. I'm going to guess that America, in 1983. Seventy. Seventy. Yeah. You'd be closer if you said ten times the amount that we spent in 1983. Get out of town. They spent $223 billion in 1983 on their military. In 1983, was uh, was Vietnam still happening? Because this is the weird thing about Vietnam. Wasn't is that, that it 70s, wasn't... like... Ah, but uh, it, late stretched, it stretched over 20 years. Yeah, well, it was supposed years. to, and that's why that's why they ended up spending so much on their military. And this is something that we'll go into, but obviously this Ooh. is this is okay. all part of the 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 privatization of defence and how war how becomes a um, yeah a, a machine. But okay. yeah, so so 223 billion dollars in 1983. How much do you think they spend now? So, five hundred billion. I'm gonna do a Doctor Evil here, but eight hundred billion dollars. Eight hundred billion dollars. Eight hundred billion dollars in 2021. That is a ridiculous amount. And like I said, that's you could literally build a country with that kind of money. Yeah. Like, and here's oh. me going with Scotland, or oh, spending 400 million in order to have their own parliament building. 
I mean, that's quite an expenditure for one building. Let's be that's fair. That's what I. That's what I thought, and I, I would have thought they would have gone like um, sandstone or something. They haven't. It, it's modern, you know, like they're going with a changing time and stuff. But I would, considering the building itself, somebody's pocketed a load there. But mm. anyway. Um, mm. Yeah, but um, eight hundred billion dollars in twenty twenty one. Bear in mind that the Russia's current that, that Russia's current military budget is sixty five billion dollars. I mean, should we just all be happy that America hasn't crushed us all <laughs> at this point? Absolutely. Or, or do you think that we should be? looking more at they because you know like it's it's clearly then in their ability to kill us so is it that the stuff I mean, that it... we're doing like what's the right way of putting it is it is it that the stuff that we are doing already benefits them and it's not worth the additional expense of going to war with that kind of defense budget I mean, you I don't know, think, in order I think, to tweak our policies. I think the UK are definitely very smart. We're definitely wiser than the U than the US, and for that reason, I think we're still allies with them. Because mm. I'm sure as hell, if I was in a playground and there was a kid that was four times my size, I would go and be his friend because I oh. didn't want to be his enemy. So it's kind of weird that that com you can make that comparison. Um, with England being wiser um, to us being a little bit of a suck up, like we, like uh, America's the the playground bully, and then we're the the wheezy mean kid who then like uh, uh, America's like, go... "What are you? Give us, give us your sweets," and then we're the little kid who goes who bends around the corner and just kind of goes, "Yeah." <laughs> Yeah, you tell him, boss. <laughs> yeah, you tell him, man. Exactly. Uh... Yeah. No, it, I mean, it, are we are we not smart for doing so? Like, I'm not being funny, but we've been the powerhouse. Mm. It didn't do us any good. So maybe in our wise old age as a nation, we're kind of going, no, it's all right. You can take the limelight and get all the grief and and be the enemy of the world, and we'll just be here. Hmm. Yep, yep. So I want to do a little bit of story time, James. Oh, fantastic. I, well, um, I, I hate to admit how much I love a story, but I do. So, the obviously, we've quite centred around um, the negative traits of military. Um, mm -hmm. And don't get me wrong, I'm not a glorifier of war at all. I don't think there's any need for a military in the modern day. Um, I think diplomacy can can over override most need for military. However, um, in those moments where the necessity has arisen, normally because the guy next door has started a row and like and you need to defend yourself, um, some people have um, had moments of sheer genius that typically explains why they were in the position that they were at that time in order to make that decision because I know if I was in that position I'd probably just be screaming running around waving my hands above my head um, waiting for a bomb to land but um, that's me and this is obviously them so in in World War two this is probably something that you have heard a lot about um, in World War two the the Nazi um, created a machine which was used to encipher their communications. Do you know what that machine was called? Enigma? Yep, yep, it was the Enigma machine, um, which was ridiculously complex, and it basically worked on... Um, there was a keyboard that you would type, um, and but you'd encode it with the, the day's encoding okay and as you type it would then spit out these lit up letters in the top which would then there would be a second person writing down what those letters were and that's the message that you transmitted so you didn't actually transmit your message directly you typed it into this machine and then it lit up 
the coded message that you needed to send. And the thing that made this machine so, for lack of a better term, unbreakable, was the fact that every day the Germans would change their code. Which means you could spend all the time you needed to in that day, maybe have a breakthrough and decipher their code. The next but day it's meaningless. The next day it's absolutely meaningless, absolutely. Um, so, and that, like, a lot of the reason why the Nazis were so effective during Second World War was because of this encoded messaging that they had. So much of what they did was secret, and nobody nobody expected it, and nobody knew what their next move was. Um, that it they literally crippled a lot of Europe before we had a chance to do anything. However, the UK um, or England rather started a um, a task force which was specifically tasked with cracking the Enigma code. And one man designed the world's first computer in order to crack the Enigma code. Do you know what his name was? I know I knew I knew that the Enigma code was one of the first computers or the the machine that cracked it. Mm -hmm. I know that he's played by the Benedict Cumberbatch mm -hmm. in a film about this. Unfortunately, I haven't watched that film. So you can actually design these machines. You can build these machines. Get out of um, And they are named after him. They're called Turing machines. And his mm -hmm. name's Alan Turing. So, yeah, as I said, Alan Turing um, created an immense machine purely designed just to break the Enigma code. Um, mm. Unfortunately, when they first broke the Enigma code, their knee-jerk reaction was to use the information and save the people that they could hear were going to be attacked. However, if they had have acted on that information, they would have plainly given away the fact that they had cracked the Enigma code. So they were left in a position where they could do very little, but they knew everything that was going to happen. But what it did do was it, it paved the way for plans to be made, which could be um, used to bring down the German war machine, which I thought was absolutely incredible. Um, another thing that happened during World War Two, which I was absolutely um, flabbergasted when I heard about this, um, you know, you know much about the Battle of Normandy. I yes. Is okay. Was the battle okay? So Dunkirk is when we ran away. Normandy is when we landed. Yeah. Um. Weirdly enough, my my grandfather on well, no, well actually, technically, I suppose he's my great uncle. Um, my great uncle adopted my mum. Um, because tuberculosis, uh, you know, I won't go massively into it. My family history is messed up. Um, but anyway, he actually was one of the pilots um, of the landing boats mm. for Normandy. Yeah. Um, so I know that a huge number of people got, yeah, a huge number of people would were, were dropped off, a huge number of people died and i know omaha beach was the the shitstorm center of it or the place where things were worse because the the air support didn't arrive the concentration of german troops in that building was higher and just there was a lot more going on mm. yeah so normandy was an absolute masterstroke as far as um the allied forces go and the reason why isn't, I mean, obviously it was wartime, there were casualties, but the f the whole ingenuity of that plan was something else. And so Winston Churchill and his allied commanders came up with a fantastic plan where they would deceive Adolf Hitler 
into believing that they were going to land at Calais. And what they did in order to trick Adolf Hitler was they lined the coast around Dover with wooden structures covered in canvas that looked like tanks and planes and tents absolutely littered the landscape around Dover because obviously Dover's where you would take off from if you were going to go directly to Calais that's where you mm. would that was where you would embark from um, and they left the army the actual army down in Portsmouth well out of the way so that their spy planes that flew nearby enough to see what was going on saw this formidable formidable force building up at Dover and Adolf Hitler was absolutely convinced that they were going to land at Calais to the point where when they landed in Normandy he was determined to believe that it was a distraction a, a diversion and that the idea was that the force would land at Normandy only to draw his forces away from Calais and allow the forces in to Calais so, so he didn't even send so he didn't send reinforcements until Normandy Beach was taken. That's a mistake. It's absolute genius mm. from the part of the Allied forces that they came up with a plan that was so believable that the mastermind that was Adolf Hitler fell for it hook, line and sinker to the point where he lost key standing in France. Mm. Um, and that was the beginning of the downfall as well, because obviously once they had the uh, the the information coming from the Enigma Code, um, and they had a foothold in France, they just pushed them back. And from there it took about two years, I think, before German forces were forced back to their own lines. Hmm. That's interesting. I'd also heard that because of... Uh, although I... I haven't, I, you know what, I really should look this up, but because I've also heard that because of the... Because of the help of a certain bank, or without the help of a certain bank, uh, I hear the war would have been over a lot earlier. Um, but that's that's interesting. Like, also, I, I know that both sides did this, because there's also... Uh, a famous joke of um, there were a load of fake planes that the Germans had made in a field um, in in Germany and what the Allies did is like one of the, the jokes of the war was they sent a plane which then dropped a wooden bomb uh, onto this fake airstrip that the Germans had made just as a way of kind of saying you know, the we jig, know. Yeah, with the jigs up, we know. Yeah, yeah. Um. Oh, well, that's that's brilliant, and that's good to hear that. That's how we were able to. Uh, how? Yeah, how we? Well, one of the ways in which we were able to overcome things. Hmm. And that's, there that's is one more story that I want to go over. <clears throat> okay. And, yep. Let's hear it. Um, this story is. Um, have you seen the film The 300? You see, I've seen it. I've also done a little bit of research. Um, okay. The things behind it, so... So you know you know where it stems from, where the base story comes from? Well, yes, it's so... The film 300 is based off of a comic book, which in turn is based off of either some Greek or Macedonian um, propaganda, which in turn is based off of a genuine historical event. So there's a lot of yeah. whisper yeah, yeah. mills yeah, yeah, happening yeah. So already. The, the numbers have been exacerbated and, and dramified and, and mm. glorified in all their means. Um, but the, the long and short of it was that there was a battle called the Battle of Thermopylae, um, which was essentially what had happened was the there was a second Persian invasion. Basically the first Persian invasion um, happened, Persians invaded Greece, um, a number of the city-states of Greece fell however um, after a while the Persians were pushed back 
um, and Darius, the king of Persia at that time, retreated back to his own country, planned to reinvade Greece, however he died before he had the chance. His son, King Xerxes, then took over and amassed what can only be described as the most formidable ancient force to ever grace the planet by that point in time. Um, mm. Now, stories have been, like I said, numbers have been exacerbated, and you might hear the number that like two million forces crossed the river and crossed the crossed the gap and um, and invaded Greece. However, the number two million is far far more than what actually happened. <laughs> it's actually nearer about three hundred two hundred and fifty thousand to three hundred thousand forces, but that even in itself is still a formidable force of its time and like i said it was probably one of the biggest forces to ever walk the planet at that mm. time um and athens and sparta were two city states that kind of unified um two greek city states which kind of unified and decided that they would not bow down to the persian orders of surrender and would would fight and they um i'm going to use the term amassed <laughs> very loosely an army of seven thousand spartans uh, seven thousand greeks rather um of which there was about three thousand spartans about four thousand um, athenians amongst them were their slaves um, and they decided they would defend um the straits of Got to remind myself of the name Artem Artemisium, um, and they would defend the um, pass of Thermopylae. Now, the pass of Thermopylae was probably the masterstroke in this plan because it was like a choke point. There was very little the Greek, the Persians could do other than pass through like a 50-foot-wide gap, which minimised the amount of forces that they could get to the Greeks at any one time, during which time that this war was going on. There was also the war on the Straits of Artemisium, where 1,200 soldiers in Persian boats came across the sea from Persia. Um, bear in mind, there was about 300, um, sold, uh, 300 of the um, uh, Greek ships on the water, and Against the 1,200 uh, Persian ships, they were massively outnumbered, massively outpowered. However, the Persians came over during a very turbulent time on the sea, and they lost about a third of their forces as they travelled to the Straits of Artemisium. And not only did they lose about a third of their forces, they also became scattered, which allowed for the more organised and local um, Greek forces to kind of pick off as much as they can, they could, of these forces. Um, so during that time, obviously the the battle of the uh, the pass of Thermopylae is going on, and like I said, there, there's a force of around 200, 250,000 soldiers coming towards the Greeks, um, and there was two solid days of constant fighting. Um, where, in historic accounts, even the um, even the page boys of the knights or the soldiers, shall we say, um, the Spartan soldiers and the Greek soldiers, would take their turn in battling against these Persians that were coming through the wall. The main thing that gave the the Greeks the upper hand was the fact that they were all wearing bronze plate armor. Whereas the Persians were wearing more leather, the, le the the Persians had their short spears and their swords, whereas the Greeks had their long spears, and that gave them the upper hand as they were coming up through the pass. Anyway, they battled on for two days, and after the second day, hypothe hy hypothesis says that there was a villager nearby that lived locally that betrayed the Greeks and told the the Greeks of a pass that allowed them to flank the Greeks. However, it's more likely that their scouts found a way up and around um, 
which as soon as Leonidas, which was actually the king of the Spartans at the time, as soon as Leonidas um, realised that he was flanked, he um, sounded the retreat and the majority of his Greek forces retreated back to, um, I believe, Athens, which was where they were, where they were based at the time. Mm-hmm. And they um, and they left behind a rear guard of which Leonidas stayed. Um, and there was about 300 Spartans, about 400 um, Athenians. So about 10% of them total force stayed behind to protect their retreat. And they all died um, in doing so. At the same time, on the streets of the uh, of Artemision, as soon as they realised that the, or they heard that the, the battle at the Pass of Thermopylae was lost, they retreated and came back inland. Um, obviously, an act of sheer heroism from Leonidas although I'm not really sure at the time he thought it was um, courage that did it I think it was more necessity that forced his hand into um, into defending his his army's retreat um, neither Athens or Sparta actually fell due to that um, Xerxes ended up his forces ended up too thin and he needed to retreat back to his country but he did leave a contingent to finish the fight in um, in Greece however um, he was unable to do so so that was how the second Persian invasion ended um, like I said an act of absolute heroism from very small numbers it is a very David versus Goliath story which is why it's been I think glorified um, in the comic in in novelty in novels in films um, the idea that such a small number can take on such a massive force um, is almost unbelievable but like I said the reason I find it so incredible is that one person or a or a, a, a number of people had the ingenuity to use the terrain to their advantage and what an advantage it gave them mm. absolutely incredible I mean it also really kind of highlights the importance of technology and or at least of equipment yeah the right equipment of the day because Just... obviously as, as I said the Greeks were wearing plate brass plate armour you know Whereas the the Persians were wearing leather, mm. like the Greeks didn't have to travel so far, so they kitted themselves out with their heaviest, thickest armor and their long spears. Um, the Persians, who unfortunately had to travel from across the sea and then all the way through Greece, travelled lighter. Um, but that in in turn was the downfall of that attack, you know. Hmm. Yeah, it was pretty. I I love that story anyway, but um, right, um, it's, it's a it's a good it's a good story, and it does highlight a lot of a lot of things there about using your yeah your environment to to its advantage. Yeah, which obviously, if you're playing stuff like um, Risk or Warhammer, <laughs> that's where it comes into play for me. And chess, you know, a strategist definitely. Um, definitely more of a strategist in those scenarios but I certainly, I don't think I could do it in a life and death scenario jeez, I'm pretty sure well, I would just it, it, it's hard to send wave after wave of your own men um, at the enemy when it's genuine people yeah, yeah, absolutely mm. Mm. so I'm going to move on now to the bloodiest wars um, so I'm going to just go with the top three, okay? And I'm not going to... I'm not going to do this whole, like, can you guess, etc. Um, but we will have a little talk about each one of them in their own rights. So, the third bloodiest war of all time lasted for over 60 years, from the year, from the year 1618 to the year 1683. It's called the Hundred and Year War. No, it wasn't. It was the Qing Dynasty conquest of the Ming Dynasty. Huh. 
um, in China, and it resulted in the death of 25 million people over those 60 years. Um, That's terrifying because back then that would have been a sizable chunk of the world's population. Absolutely, absolutely. But it also does make me think, has China always been so overpopulated? Hmm. Like, that's a lot of people. That is a lot of people to just... Be gone. You know, I know it, was, it wasn't necessarily a click of a finger, it was 60 years, but... Uh, that's two generations as well that 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 of time that that war spanned for you know what, what was the end result like other than the death count what was obviously what was the, war well, the king i'm pretty sure the king dynasty ended up winning because the king wasn't the queen uh the king dynasty one of those that is still going today or it was still going until the late the uh, early 1900s hmm So the second bloodiest war was the Second Sino-Japanese War. It was waged between 1937 and 1944 between the Chinese and the Japanese. And it killed over 25 million civilians and 4 million mil military personnel. So they were the Chinese again, but I know that the, um, the Japanese have waged quite frequent wars with China. Um, mainly because they have had massive population problems um, where they've outgrown their little islands and have aimed to take lands nearby in order to um, continue their development, continue their growth and be able to sustain their population. Um, mm. Which is a lot of the reason why they ended up with that honourable death, the, the old kamikaze, um, because it was either they won their war, or they die trying. Because going home to their overpopulated um, island was not going to give them An what option. they wanted. Yeah. Mm. Absolutely. Um, and see if you can guess which the uh, the most bloodiest war in history is. Is it the First World War? No, it's definitely the Second World War. The First World War, I think, was about sixth in bloodiest mm. wars. Yeah. The Second World War um, killed over thing. 70 million people, 50 million of which were civilians, and about 12 million, it's estimated, were Jews. Well, that's horrible. Absolutely disgusting. Well, uh, 12, 12 million Jews, that's the entire... 12 million is uh, above the population of London, or the greater London area, so that's... Yeah, isn't the population of London like 7.4 billion people, or 8 billion people? 8 million people, rather. <coughs> Not billion, bloody hell, that's the population of the world. Mm. Um, I always remember it because um, the population of the UK is 1% of the population of the world 80 million yeah 8 billion being the population of the world 80 million being the population of the world and 8 million being 10% of the UK's population being just in London mm. it's ridiculous <laughs> it is and then 70 million people dying that is isn't that higher than our current population now as a country? Um, it's near. I think we're about 80 million in the UK. But yeah, okay. it's incredible. Imagine us just disappearing overnight. Well, I suppose, I suppose over I know the years. world would go on, but like still. Well, the world in perspective, yeah. Like the world may well go on, but ours wouldn't. Yeah. You know. Um. So. I've my biggest problem with the military is that there was once a need to um, show ability to defend yourself. Mm. There was once a need because you didn't know 
what next door could do you didn't know what um might happen because of some bloke that lived over the mountains a couple of miles away um and it was a very different world um i don't feel and i i i quite op open to you um trying to change my perspective but i don't feel that then it's necessary for military to exist in the modern day and the reason i say that is because we must have learned at some point by now that war just leads to more war you only need an army because your neighbor's got an army you only need bombs because your neighbor's got bombs are we not in a position where we can discuss and negotiate um, developments instead of fighting to end disputes mm. I I wish that I could agree with you um, I wish I could say that I think that humanity uh, yeah uh, I wish I could believe that that humanity had gotten to that point um but i don't i don't i think as individuals we're there as nation states we're not like the very fact that um the very fact that the war in ukraine for example is completely russia just trying to take land Tibet has been entirely taken over by China. Uh, to be fair, they didn't stand a chance now that we know what the, you know, the sheer number of the that army was. Like, there is... Unfortunately, there is still... Um, I'm trying to think of the right way of putting it. There is still conflict. There is still unfortunately that fear there is still terror there is still tyrants like if everybody disarmed but North Korea didn't disarm I honestly believe within a generation we'd all be yeah we'd all be under the well under the heel of one of somebody with a name with the name King Jong don't know yep. which one it would be at that point but you know what i mean um yeah yeah no i think i i, you, I, I you're bang on in the fact that it would be taken advantage of i think like we discussed in an earlier podcast that human nature is very self-serving um and the opportunity i think would be too good to pass up for some people I personally could not bring myself to um, it's almost like do you remember that show was it Golden Balls with Jasper Carrot um, did you ever see that I'm, it's a complete tangent oh. here but go with me go with me it's alright it does the whole point was that you um, you built up you amassed a um, a pot of money between you and a group of people mm -hmm. okay throughout the game show and the final part is um, who gets to take the money home now if neither of you steal then you both split the money 50 50 and you both take it home but if you steal and the other person doesn't then you get all of the money and if you both steal, nobody gets the money. 
Oh my god. Yeah. Now I'm very much of the mentality that I'm not going to steal. I'm not going to steal. I'm going to share the money 50-50. We'll both go our separate ways. Everybody's happy. Yeah. Oh. But I watched this. Um, I watched the show once, and there was this woman who was so convincing. Um, and this bloke genuinely was suckered in. They were both going to walk away with forty thousand pounds or something like that. Um, and then she opens the steel ball and steals all of the money and completely rips that rug out from underneath him because opportunity presented itself she knew what she was doing the whole time and that's human nature that is for every every 10 good people there is one person that will do exactly that you know mm. um the wolf in sheep's clothing um like it's it's renowned throughout history and it will continue to be a part of human nature for a very long time probably until we develop the ability to be telepathic in which case we cannot lie anymore then you're going to look at a world without deceit because your intentions are completely out there but until such a time as you can read somebody's thoughts and know exactly what they're doing somebody is free to deceive you and that's true good intentions are only as good as the next person you know you can be as good as you want to be, but it's going to get quashed by someone at some point. Um, and this is the problem that you find in modern day. Now, my, my biggest bugbear with um, military, and it's not really a bugbear, it is a downright disgust for modern day military, is the fact that there is now a privatization of um war makers um, yep. arms dealers like tank builders like plane builders bomb makers you know they're not built out of necessity now back in the day where a farmer could um, build or make um, pikes if he needed to um, or or um, a blacksmith could could increase his capacity to building more swords for the army if he needed to. Um, now they are mass produced regularly and rolled off of a production line as if they are bags of crisps at the supermarket. Um, for example, Lockheed Martin, um, a name that has come up before in our podcast, Lockheed Martin. Um, they have remained the biggest profiters of war since 2009. That's 14 years where they have produced the most profit year after year from war. In 2021 alone, they made 50 billion out of sales which amassed to a massive 90 percent of their profit came through sales to the u.s government for their arms now if you have an organization such as lockheed martin which relies on the turnover of arms deals then you have the necessity for war, the need for war as an organization. And then you lose all sense of want, desire, need. It becomes another organization. It becomes another trade. What's your trade? Well, I'm a soldier. What do you do for money? I'm a murderer. I go to other countries and I kill their people because my my government employ me to do so because they want to continue putting money in the pockets of private organizations. Mm. Oh, 
But let's go back to the days where you defend because you want to defend. You defend because you have something to defend. You don't just defend because you've been broken down and rebuilt to do exactly as you're told. I, don't. I think that's that's where the that's where the military's lost on me. Yeah. I think I don't think there should be there definitely shouldn't be this economical gain for war because war in itself is so wasteful to be able to turn a profit in that in itself is uh, distasteful the fact that we're then making it necessary is then also a problem um i know there is there are limited uh resources in the world held the fact that so many people at the company that we we're just working at are now being made redundant you know there is only so much of the pie to go around but there are other ways to handle things yep and that's yeah just so the folks at home remember it and not at all because i'm i'm terrible at remembering things what's what's the name of that company uh lockheed martin lockheed martin lockheed martin yeah mm. and watch the news because um there's going to be a lot of developments around lockheed martin and it's it's privatized um warfare i should think over the next coming months and maybe the next couple of years Mm. Um, the problem is and I'm, I showed you I, I sent you the link to the video um, Dwight Eisenhower when he left office um, after his term as president in the US gave a speech which has resounded through history and he warns against the military industrial complex the privatization of military the need and necessity for war as an organization um, and the, the risks of privatizing power and that mm. is I don't think he could have had any real understanding of how far this has gone and how much truth there was in his speech but he does say that only an educated citizenry have the power to overcome that that force and I think more people need to be wise to to what need there is for military intervention for military action and really start to speak up when they don't agree like you go back to 2000 and what was it 2004 2005 when we invaded Iraq um, and it was a completely illegal, illegal war completely illegal war that was started under the guise of terror and weapons of mass destruction that did not exist and have been proven to not have existed mm. and yet the leaders that were in power at that time have faced very little consequence for their actions and their part in that play even though they knew and have openly admitted that there was no need for them to go to war yeah the fact that wasn't Tony Blair made an ambassador of the peace well he's literally in the house of lords why yeah. the f why is he I know I almost swore then but why is he still working in the House of Lords like why does he even still have a right to a say in what goes on in the world after that is that not an international war crime I don't want to get I don't want to get angry no, no, but no, it's no, definitely no. one of those things that really does get me get me going is when um people abuse their power and um, both George W. Bush and Tony Blair 
abused the situation that was presented to them or they or they manipulated whichever whichever is your interpretation um the whatever happened um in the lead up to that war they abused their power and sent countries multiple countries to war with innocent people unnecessarily yeah Mm. it's interesting how justice falls differently on different people isn't it yeah yeah absolutely absolutely but remember listeners and yourself James as one individual person yes you have no power at all but we're not one individual we are people the people and there is no war if we all sit down if we I'm, I'm, I know I'm sounding a little bit more like John Lennon right now but it's absolutely right in that if you are you, just are you stop, saying war is over if we want it <laughs> absolutely the, the, the point is if you're if you're part of that wheel turning just get off that wheel Get off that wheel. Just go home. Make peace with your family. Spend some time with them. Get a job. Filling shelves at a supermarket. It's still better than being part of the war machine. I could not... Be- I cannot bring myself to even believe in- to begin to think what it must take. What it must do to a person. To hold a gun. And shoot someone you've never seen. You have no idea what they're doing. What their thought process is, why they're yeah, even they are. there. Yeah. Like I would be stuck in a complete limbo of why am I doing this? Who is this guy? <laughs> I would die very quickly in that respect. Because I'd be sitting there asking too many questions, like, dude, do you want to talk about it? Like, are you okay? Should we put the guns down and have a chat, a cup of tea, you know? Um, see if we can really air this out and stop everybody from dying around us. But no, that's not that's not what you get told to do. So, but it's just it's not human. Yeah. It... Hmm. Anyway, I I think, I think... We've covered as much as we can. Like, there's a lot of other topics that we can, but I don't know about you. You, but I'm running out of energy. I I will say that I believe that there is some call for military when it comes to disaster prevention. But to be fair, that's because the military has the boats and the equipment. You could have the boats and the equipment without the guns. Yeah. But but then it wouldn't be military, it would be something else. It would be a force, wouldn't it? But it would be a rescue force. Yeah. You know, which makes a lot more sense. Would you say you could make it an international rescue force? No, sorry, right. Um, Apologies. (laughs) You go. (laughs) Uh, But anyway, yeah. Can they have their own little um, island? Well, uh, abso- absolutely, absolutely, and they'll need some kind of billionaire backing them, you know, providing providing financial aid. Yeah, uh, yeah, you know, it will need to be top secret for some reason, which they never go into. Right. Anyway, sorry. <laughs> um, before we go too far off topic, um, thank you very much for the research you've done. Um, I've really enjoyed this conversation. I've definitely learnt a couple of things. Main facts that I've taken away from this are China has the the biggest military. Um, the Vatican City has the smallest military. Uh, what else? Good old King Sargon. Had the uh, first was, military. <laughs> was the first, you know, military commander. Um, the 300 film uh, is massively um, is massively overdone, and the There wasn't just 300 of them. There was a fair few more. Uh, The spears are realistic, but the idea that they were all there in just leather loincloths and a shield and a cape 
uh, is pushing it a little bit. Uh, that I've learned America a fa- spends eight hundred million, eight hundred billion pound per year on their military. You know what? That's that's one of the things that I'd forgotten. But like that, that's a terrifying fact. Um, if there, if any one of our listeners is a quantity surveyor and wants to tell us how many houses that could build, that'd be great. Um, if one of our listeners isn't a quantity surveyor, uh, don't you know? Don't don't spend too much of your time figuring it out. I'm not going to necessarily do anything uh, for you. It's just that would be interesting to know, wouldn't it? I, I give you, I give all of the listeners a challenge, which is spend eight hundred billion pounds, eight hundred billion dollars. Write down, oh. write down how you would spend eight hundred billion dollars. Go to Reddit um, r slash pods with Nick and James or N and J pods. One of the two. I can never remember now. <laughs> it's Nick and James pods. R slash Nick and James pods. Go on there. Tell me how would you spend eight hundred billion dollars? I'm pretty sure you'd run out of ideas after about a hundred, but. I mean, I, I reckon I can spend up to 100 billion, but I don't think I can go anywhere near 800. Mm. I'm talking realistic things. Don't just make things up in order to spend money. Yeah. I, you know what? I've got a lot of things coming to my head at the moment, but I, I will. I also realise that because you've, because we're dealing with obscene amounts of money here, my mind has gone to the obscene. Yeah, Straight yeah, away. absolutely. Have a think about it, James. Chuck it on, chuck it on the, uh, chuck it on the Reddit. I'll get involved as well, and I'll uh, come up with a, a list there. of my own. Yeah. See if I can spend a hundred billion dollars, um, eight hundred billion dollars. Right. Okay. Well, right. Um, I'm gonna, I'm gonna call it good night at there. Uh, thank. If you have listened to uh, the last, this, thank you very much for listening, listeners. Yep. Thank you very, very much. Um,